back to Ephesians, from identity to destiny. And all through the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul is writing to a crazy, crazy place. How many of you noticed that the days are getting kind of evil around here? Have you noticed that? Things getting a little nuts, right? I mean, th things I'm hearing about. Uh, I just read uh, this this morning about uh, apparently the, uh, now a child claims that he's half, half a cow and half a child. They have a new name for that identity. I mean, it's insane what's going on, right? All the craziness going on in the world, and, and if you're not careful... You can feel overwhelmed, like, oh, my gosh, I'm with my family, my job, everything's going crazy in the world, there's so much violence. And if you're not careful, you can start feeling negative and start feeling down and start reading the news and look at all your news feeds. And after a while, it's like, I can't take this. is so bad. This is so negative. I don't know what's going to happen to our country, our family. Oh, no, no, no. You start feeling despair. I have good news for you. It's going to get worse. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? Actually, it was a lot worse in Ephesus than it is right now. In fact, the church had overwhelming, horrible odds. There was about 500 Christians, and then by the time the day of Pentecost came, there was 120. You had a hostile Roman government that picked on the Jewish people. They were the lower echelon of society. There was all kind of paganism going on. I mean, it was bad, everybody. What you see happening today is no comparison to what was going on in Ephesus. It was bad. They had all sorts of violence. They had all sorts of, of, of all kinds of nonsense going on. Temple prostitutes. It was a disaster. It was a mess. There was disease. There was fighting. There was infighting. There was a, a very, a very you, you, got, you think you get taxed now? It was a lot worse. I mean, you, you couldn't take anything home. Okay, it was bad. And so I have good news. We're doing a lot better than they were back then. So the good news is we're not victims. We're victors. Amen. If you're in Christ, you're not a victim. You are a victor because Jesus beat the power of sin and death. And we believe the best days are always ahead in Christ Jesus. It may not be on this place, but I know that my Redeemer lives. And I will see him in that last day, as, as Job said in that book we've been reading through if you're reading through us on the book of the Bible, so we're going through the Bible in a year. The best is yet to come. So we're not victims, we're victors. Amen. So not in myself, but in Christ, right? So we've been talking about that, and the whole issue has been that uh, a lot of times we don't understand. You go to church, and you hear about what you're doing wrong. Don't you love that? Don't you love coming to church and hear what else you're doing wrong? Last week I heard I had need to forgive. This week I have to give, Right? <laughs> Next week, I got to dig. I mean, it's always something you got to do. I don't want to go to church. Why? They're going to tell me what I'm doing wrong. And so a church is a big church. We're going to come here and kick you around, make you feel bad about yourself, go home, and you're just going to give up. That's what church is all about, right? No, it's not that about that. It's not about what you can't do. It's about what you can do. And so I, I want to encourage you because I, I have no desire to give you more of a laundry list because we have plenty of laundry lists that we need to do. How many are homeowners? There's always something else to do in your home, right? I'm going to rent again, okay? <laughs> Just the other day, I was trying to fix something in the church. I made it worse. And my wife fixed it. <laughs> Sandra. I'm a loner, not an owner, okay? Because it's his. But on the book of Ephesians, the apostle Paul is hardly in a good set of circumstances. He's incarcerated. He's in prison. And he's writing a geographical location of Ephesus. Ephesus, I mentioned, was a mess. The church was under, under duress. It was not a good situation. And he writes in this, and what does he do? He gives you a big list to do? No. The first thing he does, before he gets into all these things that you have to do, he talks about who you are in Christ. You see, if you want to change your life, you got to change from your identity, not the behavior. The behavior matters. But if you go after behavior without your identity, it's not going to work. I am a child of God. I am sitting with Christ in heavenly places. And for example, if you want to start eating healthy, don't say, I got to start eating healthy. Got to start eating healthy. And then your wife makes brownies and you have too many. <laughs> and you feel guilty, you go for an hour and a half hike because of it. Now, I'm not talking about anyone that I know. <laughs> and that's a story I'll share a little bit later on. It's called the guilt hike, okay? So. Um, but, you know, you, you, like, you want to change. Instead, I want to be this way. I am, a, I am a healthy eater. 
I care about my body. I am a healthy person. Therefore, I eat healthy. Not, I can't have this, I can't have that, I can't have this. No, I have an opportunity to eat healthy. I have an opportunity to make a difference in the world. I have an opportunity to go to work and make a difference. And so we have to get off this negative kick that our society is all about. I, we don't need stinking thinking, right? Is this a, no, this is not a, a self-help thing. This is called the Word of God. The self-help people rob from the Bible and take out Jesus. I'm telling you right now that in Christ you're more than a conqueror. You and I need to start seeing it from I identity to destiny because I'm a child of God. I'm a child of God. The Apostle Paul says, I am seated with heaven heavenly places. I am a child of God. I can do all things. When you know all that and you come to adversity, you, you identify who you are. I'm a child of God. Yeah, I may have been a loser in the past, but I serve a winner and I'm on the winning team. I get the Super Bowl ring. Hello, right? I'm on the winning team. I'm not on the Yankees. Okay? They won three games in a row. Can I hear an amen? amen? They brought in the youngins. The youngins are helping, okay? They call the, 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 what do they call them? Baby bombers are coming up, and they're doing a good job. So anyhow, I'm just sorry, beside the point, everybody. It's been a rough season for us, but anyhow. So from identity to destiny, I am a winner in Christ Jesus. In Christ Jesus. We have to start seeing ourselves. Now, the Apostle Paul is now giving us a list of things to do. But before he gets into the list, he talks about who you are. And let me make you an encouragement thing. If you want to change your life, focus more who you want to be and who you are rather than the behavior. The behavior is important. We, don't, we can't negate that. But we must see ourselves that I am a good worker. I am a good husband. I am a good student. I am a, I am a person that people want to have, spend time with. Start seeing yourself as God sees you. And I, I may be that, but in Christ, I'm a new creation. All things have passed away. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. All right? We need to start seeing what we are, not what we're not. And when you believe what God says about you, then when adversity comes your way, you look at it, I can handle it because I'm in Christ. I, I am an officer, right? I can, if, if I'm in a police uniform, I can go in front of this, of, of this uh, street here on Waterbury Avenue or whatever it's called, Waterbury Road, and I can go like this and they'll stop. If I go out there like this, they'll run me over, right? But if I wear a police uniform, right, I'm confident, not because of me, but because who I represent. Amen. I'm a child of God, all right? So we need to start seeing that. That's what the Ephesians is all about. Now, today, we're going to talk about, we talked about that already. Today is how we can overcome evil days. We're living in some evil days, everybody, right? Some bad things are happening, okay? But guess what? God is greater than the bad. And because God is greater, you are greater as well. So what we're going to do is this. We're going to read the Bible line by line, verse by verse. We're going to read Ephesians 5, 15 through 20. And then we're going to break it down verse by verse. Now, why am I doing this? Because it's so important that we read the Bible. You don't need to hear just some good some ideas and a TED Talk and all that and go home and throw a couple Bible verses up there and so I can say it's church. No. We believe the Bible transforms us because it's God's Word. And so if I give a funny sermon, you laugh, big deal. But when I preach the Word of God, it does not stop. It goes on forever and ever and ever. And I'd much rather be a part of something that's forever than my own something that's only cute. So we'll have fun, but we want to bring the Bible because the Bible is full of truth. It is the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So there's power in the Word of God. There's power in the Word of God. If you'll receive the Word of God, if you'll take it into your life, you'll let it, if you cultivate that, watch what God will do. You may have an acorn of faith, but if you put that acorn in your life, you watch it grow. It will be a very strong tree. And this is what we want to do. So here we go. Ready? Let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you that we could gather here today, Lord. We thank you that your Word is true, Lord. I really don't need to give my opinions. I want to ask you that you'd fill me with your Spirit and, Father, that you'd anoint the listeners. And, Father, that you would meet with us today in a powerful way as you already have in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, here we go. We're going to read it and we'll go back. See, then, that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody 
in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. Okay, now we're going to break it down. We're going to look at it. how do we overcome evil days, okay? First of all, see this. See then that you walk circumspectly. Now, when's the last time you used that word? I can't even pronounce it properly. <laughs> circumspectly, okay? What you want to do is tell, go, go to work on Tuesday, say, I'm walking circumspectly. What are you talking about? Okay, what does that mean, circumspectly? And I looked it up, by the way, walking. Walking is the way you live your life in the Bible. And there's all kinds of ways you can walk. You can stroll, you can meander, you can cruise. You get all these wonderful things you can do. But circumspectly is actually explaining how God wants us to walk. And what he wants us to do is be extremely careful. Okay, after having the too many brownies last night, I decided to burn it off. So I went with Matthew, my son, and we went to Castle Craig. Okay, and we'll in the Meriden. And Matthew had the brilliant idea. Let's take the path, let's take the paved part, because that way you don't have to worry about ticks. Or I, actually, I said that, not him. So we walked the paved part. We thought it'd be faster. It's not faster. <laughs> so we went kind of late because of me. By the time we got to the top, it was sunset already. And what do you call it, Matthew, when the light, when the light go, what do you call that? End of, li end of light, what is it called? What is it called? Oh, yeah, Matthew, I, told me, I, told, I learned something last night. As sunset, and there's called last light. Last light means there's no more light. <laughs> so, and then I made, the, I made the brilliant decision to leave my, car, my phone in the car because it's too heavy to carry. And Matthew has like 15% on his phone. And it's last light. And we see bears and all kinds of crazy. I think we saw a bear, Matthew, right? We think we saw a bear. So we're walking up there. It rhymes. Um, so we get to the top and all that, and then my wife's like, what are you doing? My wife just says, I'll come get you. Well, they can't. They, they closed the gate. So we're going to have to walk down. So I, I decided I'm not going to walk that path because I don't, God knows that there's a bear out there, and I'd rather go ahead and take the, the short way. It takes 15 minutes versus an hour. So I start going down. I start walking circumspectly. So what I'm doing is I'm going very careful. I can't see very well. You know, I'm, I'm walking down. Matthew's like, he's like a deer running through the... <laughs> <laughs> I'm there. He's a deer, and I'm falling on my rear, okay? So that's kind of what happened. <laughs> so I'm going down, and I'm walking circumspectly. I'm, I'm making sure I get it right, and, you know, and I fell at least three times because I had to walk circumspectly. I had to look around, make sure there's no twigs, make sure there's no ticks. I don't know what the ticks are. Make sure there's no mountain lions and alligators and all that kind of thing. I'm exaggerating to make a point. But I'm walking circumspectly. I'm being very careful as I walk down because I fell three times. And it's amazing I can even walk today. So the Bible says, make sure you walk circumspectly, not as fools, right? But as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. So we need to look around. We need to watch what we're doing. We can't be on our phone driving on the highway with our knees. We have to be watching the traffic, looking what's going on, what's happening. Um, my eyes are peeled. I'm looking very carefully, right? Not just, not just whatever, not just taking a meander. No, i got to walk carefully. Why? We're living in dangerous days. You know what the Bible says? We walk carefully and alert. Why is that? Because of this. Stay what? Alert. Stay alert. Look at your phone. No, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. You have a great enemy. I know. I'm, I'm married to him. No, you're not. <laughs> stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Who? The devil. There is a devil out there. Now, I don't think he ever messes with me. He's got better things to do with the politicians in Washington and all that kind of stuff and, and Putin and all those folks. But he does have people, he does have his, his legions of, of demons that are out there to mess us up. And so the Bible says, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. And how he normally comes after you is in your thoughts. You can't do it. You can't do this or the other. This is not going to work for you. And it gives you fear. It gives you anger. It gives you frustration. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Why? He prowls around like a roaring lion. Not a house cat, like a lion. He's preying on you. So since he's preying, we've got to be careful. We've got to walk circumspectly, right? He's looking for someone to devour. So we have to be careful. I'm not going to let that bitterness come to my life. Oh, that person just told me something I didn't like very much. Or, or that person just said I wasn't, that person just got a promotion, and immediately I'm, I'm getting jealous. Uh-uh, I'm not going to give in to the enemy and, and swallow that, 
inferiority complex. No, no, I'm going to be happy for the person that just got a pay raise. I'm going to be happy for the person that just got a boyfriend or girlfriend, and, and if you're single or whatever. I'm going to not take that bitterness. I'm not going to take that unforgiveness in my life. No, I'm not going to let the enemy get a hold of me. I'm not going to click on that thing. I'm not going to drink that thing. I'm not going to smoke that thing. No, I, I, I'm a child of God. I'm not going to, I'm going to watch out. I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to hang out with those folks because every time I hang out with those folks, I do the wrong thing. So I walk carefully. I look circumspectly. I look around me. I take care. It's like me traveling on down that, it's not really a mountain. What do you want to call it? A hill? Okay. A hill? I took a spill. Okay, here we go. <laughs> See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but wise, redeeming the time. You know where redemption is? It's something, if you ever go to a redemption center, you take something that you maybe, you, you buy something back. The Bible says redeeming the time because the days are evil. So I, I try to redeem the time. When I was, grow, when I was, uh, when I was growing up, um, we used to try to redeem the time by going faster. We had to get someplace. My father said, we're going to make up time. It's like a, it's almost like it was like a time machine. It was a 1975 Grand Torino station wagon with, with vinyl seats. And I'd sit in the back and I'd sweat. But we'd, we'd make up time. I'm going to make up time. So my father would... You know, and you go fast, you make up time. So that's like a time machine. Is that what redeeming time is? No, that's not what redeeming time is. Sometimes we think we can go faster and make things happen. No, that's not redeeming time. Redeeming time is making the most of your time, not wasting your time. In fact, I, I was reading a story the other day about the devil. Now, this is a fictitious story to help illustrate a point. The devil and his demons were hanging out. They're having a board meeting. They're having a war room meeting. They're at a the conference table. What are we going to do? What? People are coming to Jesus really quick. Marriage is getting healed. Things are, great things are happening. What are we going to do? Well, we need to slow them down. Okay. How about this? How about, I got an idea. How about we tell them heaven doesn't exist? The devil goes, nah, that's not too good. That will get only a segment of the population. Heaven doesn't exist because people know in their heart there's got to be more than this. All right, I got one. How about we talk? We say hell doesn't exist. No, that's not going to work either because people know there's a lot of hell on the earth and they can see it going worse. I got an idea said one of the demons to the devil. How about we get them to think there's plenty of time? Bring an idea. That will get them all. Hey, do we not do that, everybody? Do we not waste time? I got plenty of time. I, I'm just killing time, right? I got plenty of time. And when you drop your kid off to college, you're like, oh, my gosh, I wish I spent more time with my children, Right? If you're on your deathbed, no one ever said, I wish I bought another car. I wish I spent more time with, with my family, right? So what happens is this. We have to understand, if I told you you had 30 days to live, how would you live your life? You'd make the most of your time because the days are evil. There's nothing wrong with relaxing. There's nothing wrong with kicking back. That's important. That's part of your health. But the enemy will get us wasting time. And again, I, I'm guilty as anyone else here in this room. This is one of the ways we waste our time, Right? And, and they always send you a news alert. Like, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> news alert. Another indictment. I don't care. I don't, let me read it once a day for 20 minutes, and that's enough for me. You sit there all day getting news alerts, or how about your friend who just, got a, who just had bacon and eggs at a restaurant? I don't need to see that. <laughs> if you have bacon and eggs, good for you. Why do people take pictures of their food? I don't know. Now, if it's smoked meats, that's different. which we had at the men's breakfast. Smoke brisket at 6 a.m. We tell you, that's godly. That's godly. So, you know, we sit there and we look at stuff like that. So, uh, no, we want to redeem the time because the days are evil. I want to make the most of my time. And so, and the only way to make most of your time is you have to plan your day or your, or your, day, or your day will plan you, right? So we have to redeem the time. So we, we have to act, it, act like it's precious because it is. So we walk circum carefully. Now, how do you redeem your time? Seek what? First, the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I seek God first. I give God the first part of the week. That's why we come to church. I give God the first part of the week. And so many times I've, I've come in, I had to speak on something, and someone, uh, you have to speak. I'm like, ah, this is morning. I'm, I'm before I, before I, I go through my sermon, I'm going to have time with the Lord first. I want to read the God. I want to read the Bible for myself, not for, the, not for the church. I need to feed myself. And then God gives me the energy. Then God gives me the creativity. You see, when you seek him first, he multiplies your time. I guarantee you, you seek his kingdom first, he'll multiply your time. You'll get more done 
in less time if you give God the first. If you take a Sabbath and take a day of rest and say, I'm not going to work that day. I'm going to spend time in church and with my family and rest. I'm going to turn the stinking phone off. And guess what's going to happen? You'll be more productive in the work than in the work week than you would if you work seven days a week. I'm telling you, give your time to God and God will multiply your time. We don't do it out of legalism. We do it out of delight. So we walk carefully and alert. We surrender our time to God. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. I hear people say to me say all the time, I want to know what God's will is for my life. What's God's will? What's God's will? I'm taking a lot of pills. What's God's will? What am I going to do? You want to know God's will for your life? If you're a believer in Christ Jesus, here, we're going to actually tell you what God's will is. You ready? Are you guys ready about what it is? And do not be drunk with wine, which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit. What does that mean, not get drunk? It's water, okay? It's not vodka. What does it mean, do not get drunk? Well, the Apostle Paul is not necessarily talking about alcohol, but he's saying don't get drunk, it will ruin your life. Incidentally, it will, right? Uh, it doesn't say you can't drink, but don't get drunk. And why is he talking about drinking for? Ever hear like they call drinking what? Spirits, right? So what does he say here? And do not be drunk with wine, but what? Be filled with the Holy Spirit. And by the way, it says do not be drunk with wine. And actually the, the Greek tense and the verb tense here is very interesting. It says, do not be drunk with wine, but continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. So it is an imperative. An imperative is actually a command. Say, hey, you need to get drunk on me. Okay, continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. And it's also in the passive tense. So it isn't like you fill yourself. God fills you. Now, I've noticed that sometimes if you're, if you're stressed out or something like that, and I'm going to take a, you know, have a glass of wine and calm me down, and, and you drink a little bit, you're at a restaurant, oh, I had too much to drink, I can't drive yet because I don't want to be under the what? Okay, I heard a story of a man that got pulled over. The cop said, uh, I want you, you're swerving all over the road. Well, the officer, that's because my steering wheel's, no, I don't care. I want you to use a breathalyzer. The man goes, I'm sorry, I can't use a breath." <coughs> Breathalyzer, I have severe asthma. He goes, okay. Then we're going to give you a blood test. Come to the police station. Oh, no, I can't do that, officer. Why is that? Because I'm a hemophiliac and I'll bleed all over the place. <laughs> the officer goes, then I want you to get out of the car and I want you to walk the line. He says, I'm sorry, officer, I can't do that. Why, said the officer. He says, I'm drunk. <laughs> <laughs> so, don't drink and drive. Okay. But... You want to be under the influence. So what happens is if you're stressed out, oh, man, I need to take another one. And all, the, all during your day, sometimes people, what they'll do is they'll drink throughout the day. They'll get their keg, they'll get their pack, whatever. And all during your day, a little flask in there, I'm going to take a little shot of whiskey. As things are stressing out, oh, man, I'm stressed out. Did you hear what happened? No. And uh, you keep yourself inebriated, right? You keep yourself buzzed. I want to keep buzzed throughout the day so I don't have to deal with the stress. Because once the buzz wears off, it's still there. Well, what God is asking us to do is continue to take a swig of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Yes. I want to be filled with God. I'm starting to feel anxious. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Jesus, that you are over all things. Holy Spirit, come. I ask you to fill me with your presence. And you start filling yourself with God's presence by thinking of the right thoughts. So just, you know, you might want to just next time your friends are at work and they say, I'm going for a smoke break. I'm going for a, I'm going for a spirit break. Oh, what are you going to do? You going to drink? No, I'm going to drink the Holy Spirit. <laughs> right? Out there at the smoke break, go out there and say, Lord Jesus, I need you right now. And there's been times, uh, just recently, like today, <laughs> I had to say, Lord, I need your presence. I need your help with this one. Jesus, thank you, Lord. I, I, I surrender this to you right now in Jesus' name. Thank you. I ask for your peace, Father. Thank you. This situation... I'm going to release it to you. Thank you for your peace. Take a moment and quiet yourself and just let the Holy Spirit 
his presence fill you. That's why we come together and have these group projects together. We have group labs where we worship God together. We lift our hands. And this is not just uh, emotionalism. This is actually training ourselves so you can get to that quiet place with the Lord. It's easier together so you can practice breathing in the Holy Spirit because his, his presence is here. Even right now, if you're a believer in Christ, the Spirit of God is here. But God wants you not only to be filled with the Holy Spirit, he wants you to be baptized with the Holy Spirit as well. So what does that mean? And do not be drunk with wine but be filled, continually filled with the Spirit. Well, how do we do that? Well, not by might, not by power, but by what? My Spirit. Jesus, for the first 30 years of his life, we don't hear much about him. It's like he was a baby and when he was 12. He was brilliant, spoke, spoke to the Pharisees and the people in the temple at 12 years old. Uh, at the age of 30, he went to the River Jordan and he was baptized by his cousin, John. The Bible says... When he was baptized, the, the heavens opened up, and the Spirit of God came upon him like a dove. It was not a dove. The Holy Spirit is not a bird. Okay? It came gently upon him. The Bible says the Spirit of God came upon him and remained. So everything Jesus did, he was the Son of God. He was without sin. You and I are not the Son of God, and we, you and I have struggled with sin. Jesus didn't have that. But Jesus, according to Philippians chapter 2, emptied himself of all the rights and privileges given to him as Son of God and basically functioned like you and I will. So everything he did was in relationship with the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus told his disciples, it's to your advantage that I go away. What are you kidding me, Jesus? No, no, it's good that I go away. Why? So that he may come. Who's that? The paraclete, the one that comes alongside so they already gave their life to Jesus, and he says, hey, I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the power comes, until the Holy Spirit is baptizing you. And so what we need, everybody, not only do we receive Christ, but we need to be baptized with the Holy Spirit, and, and we need to continue to be filled. A lot of times in the charismatic Pentecostal churches, it's like, well, I speak in tongues. Should have bought a Honda, right? And I'm not making fun of tongues. Toshiba, if you don't want to speak in tongues, just be a bunch of Japanese appliances, you'll get it. But all kidding aside, I speak in tongues this morning. My spiritual language, I believe in it's powerful. But sometimes we think, well, I speak in tongues, I'm good now. No, we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit at all times. Right? We constantly need to drink in the Holy Spirit. So not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, how do we do that? We need to continually be filled with the Holy Spirit. All day long, you should have this thing tendered and ready to go. All day long, I want you to take a swig of heaven. It is water, incidentally. Okay, here we go. There's the three different words for being filled. One is called paraclete, that one that comes alongside. The Holy Spirit comes alongside of us. Another word for the Holy Spirit is in. So he comes in. So what, what does that mean? He pours in our life. And then, here's another one. We have epi, which means overflowing. So not only do we, when you give your life to Christ, this is us. We have him with us, but then he pours his life in us. But we want to be baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit where we have this epi upon. We have this overflowing. I don't know about you. Jesus said, he said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But he said, the Bible says he was talking what was going to happen when he was glorified. So the power of the Holy Spirit is available to us, the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. Wednesday night, we'll be praying for people to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you'd like to, that come Wednesday night. As we, as we, as we close out this 10 days of prayer, we're going to have a time of worship and prayer. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to lay hands on people. We're going to believe that you're filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to do that on Wednesday night. So come out to that. You'll be blessed, okay? But you shall receive power. That's what Jesus says. Dunamis. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses, in other words, do the same stuff that I'm doing, to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the earth. Now, let me show you what happens here. But when I gave my life to Christ, I got it all. Yes, right, you got the Holy Spirit living inside of you. But the Bible clearly shows there's a second time where you are prayed for, and the presence of God comes upon you. Now, in Acts chapter 10, we had a bunch of Gentiles with Cornelius. While Peter was preaching, the Spirit of God fell on the people, and they began to speak in tongues. Oh, they're baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then God's going to fill you, but it's available. Okay? So, now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem, okay, listen to this, heard that Samaria had received the word of God. So, a bunch of folks received Jesus Christ. They sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them, 
that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Why is that? For as of yet had not fallen upon them, none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of Jesus, and they were saved. Then they laid hands on them, and they what? Received the Holy Spirit. Now, let me make something very clear. People get all freaked out about this. It's ridiculous. The Holy Spirit does not make me better than you. It makes me better than me. Amen. Okay? You don't have to speak in tongues. You, it's not that, oh, oh, it's all about tongues. You don't have to. You get to. We don't put pressure on people. But all the gifts of the Holy Spirit are available to us all. And we can flow in them. Okay? So they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. We don't have to act where we're not going to levitate. We're not going to bark like a bunch of dogs and jump over chairs. If you want to do that, you can go someplace else. We don't do that here. Right? Things are done decently in order. But the Spirit of God is here for us, and he wants to empower us. I don't know about you, but I need more of the Spirit of God in dealing with circumstances. We need the Spirit of God to help us in our schools and when the pressure's about us. We need the Spirit of God when we pray for the sick. We want to believe God to move so powerfully among our midst that people can see, surely God's among you. We need more of God. But we don't just have the power of the Holy Spirit. We should have the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Gifts of the Holy Spirit does not work very well without the fruits. And so I have one church, it's all, it's all about the fruit. It's all about the power. It's called both. If I would do with, which one would I do without? I'd rather have the fruit than just the gifts. But why not have both? I want meat. I want potatoes. I want the both. Okay? If you don't like potatoes, that's all right. Turnips are better for you. Okay. So we walk carefully, carefully and alert. We surrender our time to God. We continually are filled with the Holy Spirit. And here's another one, everybody. We're joined with other believers. Good company helps you to be better. Bad company corrupts you. Be very careful. We're communicable people. We pass on what we have to other people. You'd be very careful who you hang out with. If you're not influencing them, they're going to influence you. So what does the Bible say? We are to be speaking to what? Just me and God at home. Nope. Speaking to what? One another. How are you supposed to speak to one another if you're not around one another? This is why this is important. This is part of it. And you need to get in smaller relationships. Where two or three, I was just talking to someone this morning, uh, Dave and Trisha, and we're talking about how they had a small group and how they got close together, and they still have their, their core group that meets together, and they've grown together. I know people right here in this church that their whole relationships have changed. Their life has changed because they meet together with other believers and encourage each other. So speaking to one another in Psalms, that's what we did this morning, right? Scripture, and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart. So I'm not going to get into all this right now, but that's part of what we're doing. This is what helps uh, officiate and helps the Holy Spirit come greater. Now, there's a, something I heard a number of years ago from my professor at seminary, Owen. I can't remember his name. I call him Dr. O. But Dr. O grew up in, uh, in South Africa, and he told, me a, he told us a story what happened to him when he was a young boy. Yes, that's what you think it is. It's called an army ant. They call it an army ant. They're different names. Uh, safari ants, army ants. They're nasty suckers. Okay, so what happens is this. He was out there, and all of a sudden, these ants crawled on his leg. And, and at first, he's like, oh, what's the big deal? And then all of a sudden, they started biting at once. What they do, these ants come together, and they will literally eat the, the entire carcass and leave the bones left. These army of safari ants will climb, climb on you, and they do it very quiet. It's funny. They do it quietly. I don't know if the guy has a trumpet, but all of a sudden, they start chopping up once. They, they wait. They go on the animal. They, get all, they, they actually get all over the animal. I'll show you. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. They all go like that. Isn't that awesome? We don't have it here in Connecticut, but they have it in North Carolina and Florida. Don't move. All right. They, this is what they did. This is an animal. They go all around the animal like that. It looks like rub for a barbecue, doesn't it? Okay. They go all around like that. And then what happens is they, they crawl on you first. They don't bite. They don't bite first. And then listen, they go, now. And they all bite together. Now, I don't know if they says now. Whatever they do. <laughs> but the next thing you know, you're like this. Okay. And they're incredible. They're very dangerous. Please don't bring him back, okay? So what happened was my, uh, my teacher Owen said he got him on his legs. So his parents threw him in the bathtub. 
And then all of a sudden, the ants came off his leg, and they, they, they got into a ball. And they started going like this. He said it was amazing because what happened, one side of them would be underneath the water, and then they'd have to go for air, and the other part would go under the water, and they kept turning like this so they keep each other alive. They were working in unity. There's such great power when God's people come together in unity. There's unbelievable power where two or three are gathered in my name. The Bible says God commands us blessed. How blessed it when brethren dwell together in unity. It is there that God commands his blessing. One can chase a thousand, two, ten thousand. So when we stop being separated and be unified in the spirit of God, we can all chop together and take the carcass of sin off of our culture and leave the bones of grace. Come on. So let us not give up meeting together as we had in the summer, as some has the what? Habit of doing. As you can tell, I'm a frequent visitor to the gym. I, we have a membership to the Y. It's really cheap. It's great membership. It's a, long, it's a long story. And so I feel pretty good about myself because I pay my dues. I actually pay for the membership. I, I tithe. But am I going to the gym? Right? If I don't make it a priority, I, I like going to the gym. I enjoy it. But if I don't make it a priority, I'll never get around to it. Something else will take my time. You have to make non-negotiable time with, your, with the Lord, with your family, with health, whatever you want to do. If you don't make a, an appointment for these things, non-negotiables, what are you doing? I'm sorry, I have an appointment. You have to make appointments with things. And so we have to make an appointment to come together. That's why we want to encourage you to sign up for small groups that we can all chop together. <laughs> can I hear an amen, right? That's what we want to do. We have to work together. So we, are, we can walk carefully and alert. We surrender our time to God. We continually fill with the Holy Spirit. We're joined to each other, and we're being thankful. Stop all the negativity. I know bad things are happening. Hello. We don't need to hear about it. Talk about the answer. And when you look at the answer, when the problem comes, you have the answer you're focusing upon. Don't focus on the problem. Focus on the solution. Okay, this is what we want to be able to do. It's not about the problem. It's about finding the solution. Every problem is an opportunity. Every difficulty is an opportunity. The Bible says God works all things together for good for those that love God. I don't know. This is a horrible set of circumstances, but I'm going to surrender this to God and watch you. He'll make something good out of it. He doesn't cause it, but he make it happen. You can either see the promise or you can see the problems. I don't like hanging around people that see problems all the time. Oh, pastor, so, oh, this is oh, so bad. Oh, uh, New England. I don't want to hear about Yeah, New England. Praise God. We get to make a difference in New England. All oh, the churches are not growing in New England. Ah, praise God. There's more people that need to know Christ. I don't want to hear the problems. I want to hear the promises. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? You will drive to what you think about you will drive to negativity, and negativity is no good for anybody. But you're living in a, you're living in a different world. That's right. I'm living in heaven. Amen. I'm seated with Christ in heavenly places. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, especially when we all get together and we chop together, right? So be thankful. The Bible says in the Romans chapter 1, although they knew God, they did not honor God, but would give glory to God. And their foolish hearts were darkened. They didn't give thanks. You have to thank God for what you have. You should thank God for what you have done. Thank you that I am here today. Thank you, Father God, I'm doing really well. Look, uh, focus on the positive of what God's given you. Look to the answer, right? Look to the answer because your mind, neuroscientists are telling us, whatever you think about, you'll drive towards. So I am a child of God. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm getting better. I have good mental health. I have good relationships. I'm patient. I'm kind. I remember people's names. Start driving towards that, all right? And you'll start be thankful. Thank you, God, for what you've given to me. Giving thanks always for things to God, our Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then submitting to one another in the fear of Christ.